Hello and welcome to today's Washington University Orthopedics Facebook Live discussion on the female athlete triad. Joining the discussion today is Dr. Tara Blatnick, a pediatric orthopedic physician that specializes in sports-related injuries, and Dr. Sarah Garwood, an adolescent medicine physician that specializes in teen eating disorders, weight management, as well as adolescent depression and anxiety. Thank you both for joining us today. Um, let's go ahead and get started. Um, Dr. Blatnick, would you uh, please just define for us what is the female athlete triad? So the female athlete triad, so I kind of think the history of it's a little bit interesting. So a lot of this started um, in the 70s. So that's when Title IX came about. So tons more females were doing athletic activities at that time. And they noticed that the girls were kind of having some issues with their periods and sort of led them to kind of look into it a little bit more. And so originally the triad was um, sort of three things triad. So we've got amenorrhea, which basically means they weren't having a period osteoporosis. So we think of that more in elderly people, but ju that just means basically issues with bone density and then disordered eating, or, you know, what we think of as an eating disorder was kind of how this whole thing started. Um, with some of the new, now that there's new term terminology that has started to be talked about, um, with uh, this, uh, Dr. Gartwood, would you mind uh, giving us some information about the new terminology that's being used? Sure. Uh, the term female athlete triad is still used pretty commonly, but the newer term um, is called relative energy deficiency in sports. And that really reflects the idea that for whatever amount of exercise or output an athlete is doing, the amount that they're taking in is probably not um, meeting their needs. And this term is a little bit more inclusive, obviously, because it doesn't just say female, because we know that males may also have relative energy deficiency in sports. Um, Dr. Blatnick, could you uh, list some of the symptoms for the female athlete triad? So, you know, generally, like if you're thinking of it so, sort of a, from a physician or even from a parent standpoint, um, you know, the girls, the girl, if we're talking about a female, we may think about sort of just basically issues with their period. So it may not be just specifically like no period. It may be that um, their cycles are longer. So they're more than that typical 28 day cycle. Um, they may be having um, and then no period at all is another one. Um, heavier period. They could just be changes in their periods. That would be um, one thing to look at. Um, you may also <laughs> notice sort of changes in eating habits or eating behaviors. Um, and so they may not be maybe eating as much or sort of seem to be more paying closer attention to what they're eating. And that can be not necessarily a bad thing, but it is something to kind of pay attention to. Um, and then at least from our standpoint, when I start seeing patients in with stress fractures or stress injuries, things like that from not much of a mechanism, then I start to sort of question them a little bit more about those sorts of things. Okay. Um, Dr. Gar I was just going to comment on that also that each one of the features of that triad you can think of each of those as kind of occurring on a spectrum. So everything Dr. Blatnick mentioned was sort of like different features along those spectrums. So it can, you know, people can vary from having frank, um, no periods to the kind of dysregulated period, an actual eating disorder to disordered eating along a spectrum, um, or osteoporosis, a fracture to just decreased bone mineral density. And each of those, each of those features can actually kind of occur along a spectrum. Okay. Um, also, earlier you mentioned uh, the, the term energy availability in means of athletic nutrition. Um, does having low energy availability have to be something intentional, Dr. Garwood? Right. So energy availability is, is that um, kind of amount of energy that's left over at the end of a day um, when you look at how much you took in that day and how much you put out that day. And we need a certain amount of calorie or energy left to basically cover all of our other physiologic needs to take care of our bodies. Um, that can happen intentionally if someone has changed the way they're eating in some way, they've decreased their intake, um, but it can also happen unintentionally. Um, so it could just be that their expenditure of calories has really outpaced the amount that they're able to take in. Um, it could be, um, you know, just changes in their eating, not even a, a frank eating disorder, but it could be changes like um, a really restrictive diet that's eliminated most carbs in an effort to be more healthy. Um, of course, it could also be that eating disorder um, or it could just be not eating enough. Okay. Um, Dr. Blatnick, um, is there a particular sport where a female athlete, the female athlete triad is more common? 
Yeah, so I would say, you know, they always say it is the sport that sort of emphasizes leanness. So people that we think of as having lean bodies. So gymnasts and dancers, um, figure skaters tend to be sort of high on the list in terms of what we think of as most common sports. Um, we've seen a lot more female wrestlers lately. Um, so I feel like we've seen it a little bit more in that because there's that you need to meet a certain body weight in order to participate at you know, a certain level. And so they're aiming for that body weight, which can have an effect um, on their eating and sort of lead to triad type symptoms. Um, I would say the biggest group that I've seen it in though is distance runners. So cross country runners um, or distance track runners, um, that seems to be a big population. Okay. Um, Dr. Garwood, what are some of the risk factors for the triad? What is the, why is it predominantly in females? And I know you mentioned that males can have this and what, how common is that? So it's definitely less common in males, but it's probably also under-recognized in males because we don't have that period or menstrual cycle as a marker to tell us that things are dysregulated. Should definitely be much more suspicious of a male having um, the relative energy deficiency in sport. If, they're, if they do have a stress fracture, that's definitely a reason to consider that that could be at play. But in, in talking about risk factors for athletes getting the triad, um, as Dr. Blatnick mentioned, there are definitely some sports that tend to make someone a little bit higher risk. There's also this overvalued belief that having a lower body weight might actually help you perform better in your sport. And so um, that's another reason why someone might actually have um, developed the triad. Um, there are family factors. So, you know, a lot of pressure from a parent about sports performance can contribute Coaches as well who emphasize sport performance rather than kind of the individual development of that person are um, another risk factor. There's also this interesting thing that, you know, sometimes those temperament traits that make us good athletes also set us up to be more at risk for developing disordered eating. So, you know, the desirable traits of an athlete being that mental toughness and commitment to training and, um, you know, the performance despite pain kind of mentality those kinds of traits also occur in people who tend to develop eating disorders. So there are some kind of co-occurrence reasons why when you're a really good athlete, you might also be a little bit more prone to develop those disordered eating patterns. Um, with this, uh, why, um, Dr. Garwood also, why is it so important for kids to have a good bone health as teenagers and what can, how does that affect them when they become adults? Sure. So this is a really important point because this is why we care so much about identifying this and about paying attention to those periods. There are plenty of patients I see who would be perfectly happy not to have periods. Um, and people don't always understand that that connection is really about protecting our bone health. So people really reach their peak bone mass younger than we used to think. It's more like between ages of 18 to 25 is when people reach their genetic peak bone mass. So every month that you're missing your menstrual cycle or every month that your gonadotropin levels are low in the case of males, um, you are decreasing the peak bone mass you probably can reach. And those having weaker bones means that um, you are more prone to fractures as Dr. Blatnick sees in her work, stress fractures, other injuries. But later on in life as an adult and, and on in your life, you may actually be more prone to getting hip fractures, vertebral fractures, having actual osteoporosis later in life. Um, some things that can help that are weight-bearing exercise. The biggest one is getting those regular periods and having enough energy. Um, but we may not be able to recover that lost bone mass. And so, you know, it is uh, actually somewhat urgent that we pay attention to missing periods or low gonadotropin levels in males because we are really in a critical time period in that adolescent to young adult period that we can protect our bones and accrue that peak bone mass. As I say, I always tell patients that you want to, you, you know, you only get to a certain level and you want to get up here, not here. You want to make it all the way up. So you want to really achieve that peak because that's all you're going to get. So basically it stays steady and then it's going to go down. So we really want to get it up as high as we possibly can. Um, Dr. Blatnick, she mentioned, uh, Dr. Garwood mentioned for, uh, stress fractures. Um, in, in relation to the triad, um, what else can female athletes do to prevent these, um, these from happening in addition to what was mentioned? Yeah, so I think, you know, really COVID has brought sort of some of this to the forefront because we've had changes in training for athletes. And a lot of it about not getting stress fractures has to do with 
the right way to start training and to kind of maintain training through a season. Um, so you never want to go from doing nothing to doing a whole, whole lot, which we, we happened a lot with COVID because people went from sort of being quarantined and not doing anything to really to playing in tournaments, to running races, to doing things like that. So a lot of it's all about just sort of a gradual increase in activity so that we don't sort of over, over, um, I think of the right word, but just to kind of over stress those bones too quickly, because that's what's going to end up leading you to those stress injuries. Um, back to the bone density, when is, I mean, how do you test a bone? How do you test the bone density in a teenager? And what can the low uh, density mean for athletes um, in terms of their injuries? Like, yeah, so typically, so what we typically do is a DEXA scan. So it's what you would think of for even doing an adult if you're looking for osteoporosis. But what we do is we look at an age match score as opposed to what we look at for older adults. So we look at, I believe it's the Z score. Is that right, Sarah, the Z score? Okay, yeah, so you're looking at the Z score and that's for age matched people. So you're looking at people of similar age and what their bone density should be. Um, and so if it's getting below a certain level, then we worry that your bone density is getting low and then that's gonna put you at risk for those stress fractures or those stress injuries. Um, Dr. Garwood, uh, what can a parent or coach do if they're concerned and would sh when should they uh, do screening for the triad? So it's always a good idea to start by, you know, talking with your child and exploring whether they have been intentionally restricting intake, whether they've been trying to lose weight in some way, um, you know, asking about have periods, kind of trying to make sure that your adolescent female is continuing to have regular periods and talking with your adolescent about why it's important for their long-term health and well-being that, that they continue to have periods. It's kind of sometimes a a myth out there that, you know, athletes just miss periods and that's okay. And it's actually, I, I really try to educate people that it's actually not okay. And, and even Olympics policy statements will tell you that, that it's not okay to miss periods. And we need to intervene um, if this is happening in a persistent way for athletes. So talking with your, with your team first, exploring and educating them is important. Um, and then really a prime time to, to try to identify this is that pre-participation physical that athletes should be doing before the start of a sports season um, or you know, a well adolescent visit is another, another time when the pediatrician hopefully reviews growth charts, you know, asks about all those markers of health um, and then finds out whether or not the adolescent should really be clear to full participation in sports or not. Because if, a, if an adolescent has been missing you know, the past nine months of menses or periods, um, It'd be a good idea to have a plan for intervention before you just clear them for their sport. Okay. Um, again, whenever you, both of you, I would like both of you to answer this, but what would you say when a patient comes in, what would be a red flag for either one of you? Dr. Blatnick, would you like to answer that first? Um, I think BMI kind of is just an initial, like, I mean, cause everybody's going to get vital signs. They're going to get their weight, their height, I think. And when you start to see BMI is kind of in that like low fifth percentile range, kind of below that 18 kind of, I've had kids border in the 15s and 16s. Um, I think it's sort of just an initial kind of flag up, like, Hey, we need to start really having a good history and a good chat about, um, sort of what nutrition looks like, what periods look like that sort of thing. So it's a good, at least just a kind of a screening tool. Um, also with sports physicals, there's generally, and especially at the college level, they have a nice little screening tool that you can look at as well too, that kind of has them answer questions sort of pertaining to the triad. And if they're screening positive for those, then just knowing to delve in a little bit deeper um, for those questions. Dr. Garwood? Yeah, I would, I would agree with everything um, that Dr. Blatnick said. Um, I think the advantage that a primary pediatrician will have that Dr. Black Nick may or may not have based on the, the growth charts that she can see, uh, that I can see, is that their growth trajectory over time really is also very helpful because sometimes, but I think it's an important point that we haven't made yet, you can have a normal weight and have relative energy deficiency in sports. Um, and so it's actually, and, and you can also have just dropped off a curve, but still be within a normal weight range and have that problem. So ha having growth charts um, and reviewing kind of historically what's gone on for a patient is also super helpful. Um, as subspecialists, we don't always have that, but um, premium pediatricians usually do. And, and that's also very helpful data to be reviewing. Um, and then of course the periods being the really big one. Um, and that's actually a screening question on the physical forms, you know, about in the past 12 months, how many periods have you had? Um, so 
we really do look at it kind of like a vital sign as an indicator for bone health. Also important to go to your primary care pediatrician if possible for your sports physical because they're going to have all that data and it's you're going to get a much better sort of comprehensive comprehensive exam because they they know you and they know your history and your growth charts and all that sort of stuff. Whereas, you know, a quick one at a you know minute clinic or a drugstore, they're not going to have access to that and they may not delve in as deep. Okay. Um, how is um, once there's been a diagnosis, what is the treatment plan? Dr. Blatnick? I may let Dr. Garwood take that sure. one. I mean, there's a lot of referral stuff that has to happen. I think it's a big team approach for this, for sure. Yeah, it really depends on kind of where they are in those spectrums that we talked about. So if someone has a diagnosable eating disorder, as well as the other features, then you would be really wanting to approach it in that comprehensive team. So if they have the full triad, essentially, you would wanna have um, you know, a doctor involved for medical supervision. You would likely be referring for mental health care with a therapist, probably a dietitian, and you would really be probably more strongly considering limitation of their sport. Um, if, however, they have some you know, just inadequate intake and it was inadvertent, they just have really high expenditure and they haven't been able to meet it, um, then you may start with a sports nutritionist only um, and have them follow up with weight checks with a sport nutritionist. Um, and then you may have, if there's some other kind of in between those two things, you might just have them see the regular doctor as well as a nutritionist and kind of be followed over time. In general, when you are suspicious that relative energy deficiency is the cause of missing periods or menstrual dysfunction, we would say to start with increasing intake every day by about 300 calories a day and consider decreasing their participation in their sports by like 10 to 20%. There are some really good clinical guidelines out there that take into account all the risk factors. Um, and then depending on sort of how many points you tally up with your risk factors, um, then there's guidance on clearance for your sport, provisional clearance versus pulling out of your sport until recovery happens. So um, it, it sort of depends on where you are, but I can guarantee one pretty universal thing is going to be to bump up your calories by at least 250 to 300 a day. So you can start there if you're a parent and you identify that this is probably going on. You can start with that and then seek medical care too. Um, also along that side, why is this prevention, early diagnosis and intervention so critical for these patients? I mean, I think it all comes down to bone health is kind of what we talked about earlier is that restoration of the menstrual function, getting their periods back um, is really important for that, for getting those estrogens and everything back in order so that bone health is back in order. And we just don't want them, you know, even though they may not see it as an immediate problem, it's going to be a long-term problem for them. So osteoporosis and all those things as they get older. Um, so we just want to protect them from that. So the faster we can intervene and, and get that back in order, the faster, the better it's going to be long-term for them for their bone health. Right. And also, you know, we know that prognosis for eating disorder recovery is better the earlier intervention that you have. And so the longer that we let an eating disorder go on and on, kind of the, the worst prognosis somebody can have. Is there anything else that you guys would like to add in or any um, other thoughts that you have regarding um, diagnosis and, and red flags? I think we've, I think we've, oh, I guess I'll just make one more point. If you're an athlete and you have regular periods, you actually have better bone density than other people. So uh, here's a plug for maintaining your athleticism, but making sure you get those periods because you'll actually be better off on that peak bone density. That is true. Well, I want to thank both of you for joining us today and everyone for watching. Um, uh, again, thank you so much for taking your time from your busy schedules. I know, um, you guys were in the middle of clinic and had to take time out, but really appreciate it. And um, thank everyone for joining us and everyone have a great afternoon. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye.